Well, come on in if you're if you're out there, come in. Let's talk for a few moments. I did not make it out of town this weekend like I thought I was going to. I had um, I ran into some unforeseen difficulties, meaning that my car. didn't want to do right and my car transmission is messing up again after I spent about five thousand dollars I don't have literally don't have because I had to actually get a loan <laughs> to pay for it my transmission still getting me crap drove for one good month after I got it fixed one probably not even a good month no, it hadn't even been a whole month since I got it fixed. And guess what? My transmission put me down. <laughs> so I'm stuck <laughs> in Metro Atlanta. I should be down south in Valdosta with my kids and grandkids at Wild Adventures. But, nope. Not to be so. <laughs> So since I'm here, come on in, let's let's have a, a dialogue. Let's have a discussion. And one of the things I guess I want to discuss, because I know it's going to get a little heat and kickback on it, and y'all might as well join into the discussion. It's going to be good. This is not going to be a long discussion, but it's going to be a good one. So on my page, and I don't know why, my camera look like that because it shouldn't be doing that. Hold on. Yeah, got rid of the little haze that was on it. So, how about this? I did a video earlier today. Um, so, I got a lot of things I do want to talk about, but we're going to go piece by piece. So, I did a video earlier today, well, a few moments ago, rather, about what y'all call the Ten Commandments. Because, you know, a lot of people are always fussing at us Christians. Why y'all don't keep the law? Jesus says to keep his commandments. So I gave y'all a little short video to answer and rebut those people who love to say that you as Christians are not following the commandments. And anytime somebody tells you that, tell them what I said on the video, that your understanding of Hebrew may be a little bit off. Because the Hebrew never calls them Ten Commandments. They're going to fuss. They're going to tell you you don't know what you're talking about. Yada, 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 yada. But give them the Hebrew. They tell them to look up the Hebrew word, Asarat Hadavaram. And then tell them to come see you in the morning. Because once they look up that Hebrew word, those he, those two Hebrew words, Asarat Hadavaram, they will, real, they will come back to you Probably like them Jehovah's Witnesses did me that day when I told them that their Bible says that Jesus is Jehovah. And when I showed them in their Bible where it actually says that at, they grabbed their New World Translation out of my hand and said, sir, you have a good day. And they stopped coming to my house for a long time. They put me on that new do not do not witness list that they have at their um at their um at their kingdom hall. So again, I gave y'all a video. It's a good video, and I hope y'all enjoy it, and um, and all of that. So I hope y'all enjoy it. And uh, so for those of you that won't look at stuff like that, I got to do a video on the tattoo thing. So I did a teaching on tattoo on live that somebody asked me for that I'm going to have to actually go back and do a three-minute video, try to condense everything I said into three minutes to talk about the tattoos. But this morning, God gave Israel... Well, this afternoon, rather, God gave Israel two tablets of stone. And the way the Hebrew actually reads is that when God wrote them with his finger, he didn't just write uh, one side with his finger and then wait and then wrote the other side. He wrote both sides at the same time. It literally says God's finger went through the stone and writes at the same time. So while God was writing, you know, I am the Lord thy God, you shall have no other gods before me. 
uh, he was writing, thou shalt not kill. And the, whatever commandment is the comparable one to that, because each commandment flows into uh, its sister commandment. I hate to use the word commandment, because that's what we, we've grown up with, but it's actually not the word commandment. Because the Havarum does not mean commandment. It means words. You know, out of the mouth of God, man shall live by the, every word, every Havarum that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, so when God gave Moses those two tables of stone, he calls these things the Asarat ten, Havarum, words, ten words. The Septuagint, I don't know what commandment, but we all got, before I block you, realize all of us got some kind of defect on our body. And so since you want to talk about my teeth with something I can't help because that's how I was born with them when they came out like that, you have a good life, my friend. Show your ignorance and stupidity somewhere else. We don't need it here. And I'm going to have to go back through it because I added some words I didn't want to add to that list. Block you. And let me go back, because if I don't go back and get rid of those extra words I just added, some of y'all are going to be able to comment. <laughs> Let's see how I can get that, get some of those words off. Do, 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 do. Comment settings. Block keywords. Get rid of that one. Get rid of hey. Okay. God, I got words. No wonder everybody been getting uh, blocked on this thing because it's a lot of words on here that got put up. Okay. No wonder it was blocking a lot of people. I, okay. I didn't know it, it had some words on there we shouldn't have had on there. Like if you said, hey, you could get blocked. Your comments could get blocked. I didn't know that was on there. What was I at? Okay. Um, let me get rid of this person too. There's always these crazy. When you talk truth, some 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 uh, ninja always come along. So, we, okay, let's talk. Um so, what we call the ten words, see, they only, the devil only does that because he don't like the truth. And so what he does, he brings people on here that'll do stuff like that because they don't like truth. And so, the Septuagint uses the phrase, the Decalogue. When I was an African Methodist, I said this on the video, um, we recited that on Sundays. We would recite what we call the Summary of the Law. And every first Sunday, we'll do the full Ten Commandments. On the uh, every other Sunday, we do the what we call the summary of the law, uh, what really the words of Jesus, and um, we call it the Decalogue, the Decalogue, ten words from the Latin, the, the Latin Vulgate, from the Greek, excuse me, the Latin Vulgate called it the Decim Verba or Decim Verbum. And I'm blocking you too because that has nothing germane to discussion. If you ever been on here, you would have known why I don't get braces and all that. Don't need braces. What I need to do is wait till these two are going to do what they do. And then I'm going to go ahead and get it repaired. Get it. So please mind your own business. My teeth has done do discussion. That's a good way to get you blocked. Always, always little clowns that do that stuff here. And so, as I said, the Latin Vulgate called it the Decim Verba or the Decim Verbum. And uh, it, again, calls it 10 words. Verbum words is where we get our word, verbum where we get our word verses from. William Tyndale in the 1500s called what we, what y'all call the Ten Commandments, he called it the 10 verses. But the King James called it 10 commandments. Why did no other Bible translation before the King James called it the Ten Commandments? Because God didn't call them commandments. God called them words. And when people, especially my brothers and sisters who love to harp on 
that you know y'all follow the, the white man's religion uh you you guys uh follow colonizers and they use all these verbose words to describe white folks people uh people who have less melanin in their skin than I do what they uh and you just found yourself blocked as well And so, as I was saying, as I was saying, um, <clears throat> let me see who on this list I need to go ahead and block, because I'm tired of these crazy folks coming up here over the media. Yeah. So, as I was saying, why would the King James part from popular convention, and instead of using the words that God used, which is Aseret HaDevarim, which is ten words, Hey, Jesse, how you doing? That's my daughter, everybody. Why would uh, the King James depart? I, can I tell you why? Because most of y'all who have followed me on a regular basis, most of you know that I, I actually tell you, even though I like the King James, but the reason why I use the King James is because I know these little nuances about the King James. And I'm not going to sit here like... People like uh, uh, Geno Jennings and his camp, and pontificate about the King James as though it is uh, without fault on it, because the, the King James is just a version of the original text. It's not the original text. So since it's not the original text, it can contain error. Your bi the Bible as it's originally written does not contain error, but the King James is just a version, so it can contain error in it. That's why we must study. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved by God. A workman need not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. So when I look at the, when I pick up the King James, I run, first thing I recognize is that God never spoke in English in time past. So now that's the first thing I must realize. So I must realize when I come to this, I approach this as what it is. It is a version of, of the original text. So if I'm a real student of scripture, I will go into the book and look up the words so I can find out what they meant when they was transcribed the New Testament in the first century, all the other books within the time period that it was written. And then I can find out what it is actually saying to us. Now, that being the case, the Bible, again, like I told you just then, the King James Bible, this Bible I got in my hand, is the first Bible to refer to those command, those things that God gave as Ten Commandments. Why, Bishop, did they, the King James, have you ever read, I don't know if this one got, yes it does, have you ever read this thing at the beginning of the King James Bible? This is, this dedication to King James is the reason why we have a King James Bible. James was from Scotland. James has now taken the throne of England. And uh, and uh, before him, there was a lady called Elizabeth. Y'all remember Elizabeth I? Um, she was called the Virgin Queen. I highly doubt she was a virgin because we know she had many suitors. But... Um, if y'all don't know what her suit is, then that's on your that's on your problem, not mine. So King James, because he was from Scotland, taking over English throne, and there was no Great Britain at the time. Uh, uh, there was no uh, uh, um, Great Britain at this time. When James take the throne, there's a union of the crowns. They're not a union of the nations yet. But there's a union of the crown in one person. So there's two separate countries, Scotland and England. England at this time consists of England and the Principality of Wales, which was at this time considered a constituent part of England and not a separate principality. And so to secure his place on the throne, there was a need for a new Bible because they found out that the Bible that preceded this Bible, which is called the Bishop's Bible, when the scholars were, kept looking at it and the bishops kept looking at it, 
they realized when they compared the Greek and the Hebrew and even the Latin Vulgate text, they found out that the Bishop's Bible uh, did not really agree with the original text in a lot of places. And there was a need for a better translation in English. You also got to remember, too, that the King James Bible helped standardize English. So there's a, there has been now six English translations of the Bible, and each one of them differ in how they are read. So they need a translation that is modern, that is um, corresponds to a lot of the vowel shift, the consonant shifts, and all of that stuff that's going on in the English language at this time. Because English has been very fluid during the first part of the Middle Ages up until the 1600s. And by the time we get to the 1600s and 1700s, what we currently speak as modern English is now going to be solidified because of the printing of the King James Bible. And a lot of things that we have in the King James Bible is going to immediately become obsolete about 100 years after because of the vowel shift that's taking place in the English language. I, I'm a student of history. I study history. I know all this stuff. That's why I'm able to regurgitate this. And you can look this up for yourself. So then, with all of this taking place, they needed, James did not want to agree on a new Bible. So in order to get James to agree on a new Bible, they began to... If you read this letter in front of your King James, if your King James have this, it would tell you that they kind of buttered the king up. Pretty much says to the king, if you want to solidify your place on the English throne, then you need a Bible that will reinforce the divine rights of kings. And what do kings give? Decrees and commandments. So, what happens? Jesus, not Jesus, excuse me. So, what happens when they translate this? They do certain things in this text. For example, there's a word that should not appear in your King James Bible. That if you translate the Hebrew in certain places and even the Greek, it should be in there. That's the word tyrant. Because they don't want the king to be viewed as, and monarchy to be viewed as tyrants. There's other changes made in some of the words. This does not invalidate the scripture. For some of you that are trying to find a way to invalidate the scripture, this does not invalidate the scripture. Because those texts that they kind of alter a little word, a few words they, they alter, doesn't change. You know why I know it doesn't alter scripture? Because there's a scripture in the book of um, Genesis where Esau comes to uh, to uh, Jacob, Jacob is cooking porridge, a stew. And the King James says that uh, Jacob, Esau said, man, I'm hungry, I'm famished. Uh, will you give me some of that that red, that stew that you're cooking? You know, because I, I, I'm, I'm famished, I'm famished, or something to that nature. I'm paraphrasing. That's not what he said in Hebrew. If you look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew literally says, uh, me hungry, give me some of that red, red stuff. That's literally what the Hebrew says. And so it doesn't change the text. Even though the King James kind of colored the text a little bit, it doesn't change the text. The stew was definitely red. It was made from meat, venison. Um, my religion is Christianity, my friend. That should already be noticeable because what I just told you, if you go look at my page, it says I'm a Christian bishop. So that should not even be a question. Thank you very much though, for asking it. Now, as I said, so so as I said, as I was talking, and so it doesn't change the text. Usually people ask that question because they think you're contradicting the Bible because they don't understand how to study the Bible. And so people ask questions like that because they're looking at you saying, well, aren't you tearing up the inspiration? The iner- no, I'm not tearing apart the inerrancy of Scripture. It's just that people don't know how to, people, most people, most of us come from churches that do not teach us how to correctly exegete the text, to de- rightly divide the text. And so when you when you find people that actually study the text and show you how to properly do this, it becomes like something new and like, 
wait a minute, what are they doing? Are they trying to really undermine? No, we're not undermining the text. We're showing you how to properly study the text so that when you confront people like a Muslim or like a Hebrew Israelite or like a Jehovah's Witness, you'll know how to properly debate them instead of saying the Holy Ghost told me. Because that's subjective to say the Holy Ghost told me. Uh, so you, you can't do that. So my job is, as a man of God, my job is to help you do more than just say the Holy Ghost told me. My job is to do what the Bible said in 1 Peter 3.15, to help you come up with a logical defense for why you believe what you believe. So I show you how to do what? Rightly divide the word of truth. So when we understand that, we understand I'm not offended, my friend. I was never offended. If you if you knew me, you'll know how I act when I get offended. No, I know where the question comes from. You are the one offended because you tried to defend yourself because you didn't do the proper research before you asked the question. You would have one offended. My daughter's on here. My daughter would tell you, no, daddy ain't offended. Did daddy change colors? No. No, you're still in your offense because the teacher put you in check. And instead of you being a man and saying, I'm sorry, I, I misjudged you. You thinking that what I'm saying is offensive. I'm not being offensive. I'm being a teacher. See, the word, See the thing about a teacher, we, we, we try to uh, compare and contrast. That's what real teachers do. They compare and they contrast. A lot of churches don't teach you that. So like I said, uh, no need to take offense. I wouldn't, if, I'm, if you listen carefully to what I'm saying, I'm not just talking about you, I'm talking in general. I've been doing this TikTok longer than you've been on here watching me. And so I know for a fact people take offense. So stop taking this personal. This ain't about you. This is for everybody. But so you're taking it personal instead of sit here like you claim you want to do, learn and listen. Because I've been stopped redressing you. Then my friend, you don't have to defend yourself Somebody tell this cat he does not have to defend himself if he's not offended. All he got to do is sit and listen. Because everything I'm saying right now is applicable to growth and development. I can show it to you from Scripture. 1 Peter 3.15. To learn to give a logical defense. Don't just read the text and say the Holy Ghost said. Don't just say it because I, I speak in tongues. I'm not offended, my friend. You don't know me. And since you don't know me, you got one more chance because you don't know me. You're going to make me get into offense if you keep assuming that you know me. I'm not offended. I'm trying to help you. You don't understand. A doctor would cut into you, not because he's trying to hurt you. They're not going to hurt unless they put give you some Novocaine. I don't have Novocaine to give you in the spirit. But what I have is going to do what the Bible says. It's going to cut. The word divide means to cut. And cutting is not easy. This is not this of feel-good Christianity. Feel-good Christianity is what messing the church up. I'm trying to give people Christianity like it's supposed to be. Oh, oh, give me a minute to finish talking about what I'm talking about, the divine right of kings and the King James Bible, and then we're going to talk about that because I, I, I really want to talk about it. Help now. I'm going to block you because you, my friend, need to be saved. You don't have the Holy Ghost and you don't discern what the Spirit is. Because if you had the Holy Ghost, you would listen. But thank you very much. You have a good life, Mr. Lee, whoever you are. Now, as I was saying, I just wasted about 30 minutes trying to help this guy, and he's stuck in a fence. Now, let's, let's, for those of you that like to listen, let's keep going. That's why it's so important to understand this book. Because otherwise you get caught in a fence. And what you'll do is, somebody start preaching from this book. And when they preach the truth, it goes against what your church taught you. And so, why it's so important? Because again, like I said about this Bible, this Bible has an introduction to King James. Why? Because this is important to understanding the King James Bible. Because the King James Bible is, is written to give them a current translation. But, to make, but it is written with the idea that is going to support James 
position as being anointed by God to be king, not only in England, but in Scotland as well, because he has divine right, divine appointment. So then, the reason why the word commandments is substituted for the word words, because it wants to reinforce the idea that you are supposed to obey the commandments of the king. Now, this is detrimental because the BHI movement, if I have to tell you what it is, then you don't know what I'm talking about, then don't worry about you, but everybody else should know because I had to deal with that, the crowd. They will holler about, we're supposed to keep the commandments. We're supposed to keep the commandments. Well, what commandments? Well, in the Greek, there's only one, two, set, two words that are called commandments in the Greek. Guess what they are? Love God. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your spirit. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and all the prophets. So it's only then that Jesus gives us commandments that we are to obey. So he says, love God. So when people say, you're not keep, keeping the Ten Commandments, I am keeping the Ten Words by keeping the two commandments that Christ enjoined upon us as believers. They're going to look at you like you're crazy. No, I say, no, I'm keeping the Ten Words. And every word from the Law and the Prophets by keeping the two commandments that God told me to keep in Christ Jesus. I am to do what? The great commandment is to love God, the Lord your God, with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. With all that you are, love him. The second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if I keep these two commandments, I have already kept the ten words that Yahweh gave us in the Torah. Lord have mercy. Somebody ought to say, preach Henry. I think I just did. Yeah, now, let me, let's, now with that being said, I hope that was plain enough for everybody. Please tell me that was plain enough for everybody. I hope I broke it down real good so that you could understand it. Now, let's go to the next thing, the question that was asked by my brother AJ. This is interesting. Now, now you know how people love to say it don't take all of that to serve God. And not, I know there are churches that are non-denominational that don't do vestments and what have you. But tradition is very important. I want to say this one more time. Tradition is very important. Tradition, I want to write this down because I'm going to talk about this later in the book. Tradition is very important. I know people say, well, my church, don't, we don't keep tradition in my church because we don't believe in that. We just believe in relationship, not religion, but relationship. Well, Paul says in the book of Thessalonians to keep the traditions that was given orally and written. Somebody must have said something based on those 10 words I put up that block people out out of this discussion. So, yeah. So traditions, in according to the Bible, is not a bad word because tradition was given by the apostles, both orally through their mouth and written through the scriptures. Did y'all get that? Did y'all get that? Ignorance is dangerous. Yeah, biblical ignorance is definitely dangerous in this world because some people don't know God and don't know Scripture. If you're talking about anything else, if you're trying to call Christianity ignorance, then I'm waiting for you to reveal yourself, then we're going to block you out of this discussion. Uh -huh. So uh, let's, let's continue on. So then, that being the case, Great Britain has a monarchy. Now, most people in the United States don't understand the monarchy. And the reason why, because... Even among Great Britain today, the real when I say real history, I'm not talking about slavery and all that other stuff. I'm talking about why Great Britain still has a monarchy is not really taught. Let me get rid of this cat right here. Because I speak by going to the Greek and the Hebrew. I don't speak by based on ignorance, and I speak through history. And so you got yourself deleted because you don't know neither the Greek, Hebrew, or history. So with what I just said. The reason why Great Britain still has a monarchy is interesting. You have to go back to the Saint a little bit before the King James Bible is written because they had 10 years as a republic. They had 10 years as a republic. 
Did y'all get that? They had 10 years as a republic under Cromwell and his son. God bless you, Bishop Dwayne Coleman. So under a republic, the republic led, was really, led, it led to a dictatorship by Cromwell and his son. And Cromwell and his son, as Lord Protector, were, were king in everything but name. And this was under a republic where everybody was supposed to be equal. And Cromwell and his son became the dictators. Why is that the case? Let me get rid of this uh, nut here because they don't want history. They want, I ain't got the history out yet. And then they finish sitting here trying to come. I don't know no humanistic teacher that don't want to devoid things away from God and scripture. So let me give it to you. So, as I was saying, I teach history too. That's what I went to school for besides Bible. So who, who, who credentials better? Let's keep going. Now, as I was saying, so the English was the only country that had a revolution that reinstated a monarchy. Did y'all catch that? England was the, is the only country that had a revolution to re, because they realized they had more freedom under a king than they did under a monarchy. So when they brought the king back, the king technically ran the country. But he was supposed to run the country. This is why it's so important to listen to the oath that the king takes today, took to this morning, starting at 5 o'clock American time, 10 o'clock their time. Charles took an oath to uphold the laws made by parliament. It says by his people, that people mean parliament, according to law. That's very important. And there's a video online that really talks about this in detail. I'm going to see how to upload it and to my TikTok or maybe just re-upload it to my, to my YouTube page so y'all can see it for your benefit. That talks about, it's a British guy that talks about this. And so there was tension between king and parliament for a long time. The king is supposed to obey the will of the parliament. Like the president of the United States is supposed to obey the will of Congress and execute the will of Congress. Well, the, king, the problem is, is that in England, is that though the parliament makes law, they make law by advising the king to enact laws in his name. Hey, Mark, how you doing? To enact laws in his name. That's why if you look at the parliament, it says, um, the king, most excellent majesty, and they mention the king's name, uh, does enact on the advice of his lord's temporals and spirituals and his commons assembled in parliament. Yeah. So like in the United States, it says the, the, the president's, as he when he signs it, it's the Congress that enacts it, and it's the president that approves it, and it becomes law. When in England, king, it is done in the king's name, and the king enacts it in his name, as though he wrote it out, and he has to he has to make sure it is done. That is still the rule to this day in England. A lot of people don't know it. That's why the prime minister is not elected by the people. The the king king um. God, which king it is? I can't remember. It was either King George the First or King George the Third. One of these kings could not speak any English. He spoke German, and so under him, the first Lord of the Treasury became his prime minister, if you will, George Warpole or something to that nature. I forgot something to that nature, and he became the first considered to be the first prime minister. When he does what he does, and after we do, after they finally do get a king that can speak English, the king says to him, to the prime minister at that time, I want my authority back. Well, the prime minister refuses, and the parliament kind of agrees with it. So in England, there is three, two factions that are always in tension, king and parliament. King is supposed to do the wishes of parliament. To make sure that they have a king that does the wishes of parliament, you have somebody that stands in between. The problem is that a few years ago when Boris Johnson was president, was prime minister, the Supreme Court actually messed up when they agreed with parliament over prime minister. Because the prime minister has to have the authority to do two things, to make the king do what he says. That's why the king always does 
what the prime minister says. But the king, but the, the prime minister does not just keep the king in check for the parliament. The prime minister keep the parliament in check for the king. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. It has double tension. And so Charles does actually rule and reign, but he rules through the prime minister. The prime minister makes sure that the parliament does, because what? Unlike our Congress, in our Congress, the president must introduce something through a, a, a representative or a senator. It does not say, they don't say, oh, the president wished the parliament could sit. No, they introduce as a bill based on that member, even though it may be sponsored by the president. The same way with the president budget. A member will introduce that budget as a bill, not from the president, but a budget as, you know, as well. So in, but in England, the king can write a letter and say, and the parliament will stop at that moment. There's a message from the king. The king wish his most excellent parliament assembled now, Lord Spiritual, Lord and Lord Temporals, as well as the commons, to review a, a certain law and make a law based on this. That's what he did a few months ago when he wanted to get rid of Andrew and uh, what's the guy name is uh, Harry from being uh, what, they, what they call counselors of states. So they changed. So they are in the process of changing that law now, so that Harry nor Andrew can serve as the king's counselor of state. I keep telling people that when you when you are American looking outside and don't know the system, most times you're gonna agree with what the world is saying. And so what the world say? Oh, the king reigns but don't rule. Yeah, he does rule. He rules through his ministers. And yes, the king does have still have authority. He has what we call the prerogative that he can act on his own. The king, not parliament, is the head of the army. Yeah, the king, not parliament, is the head of the army. The, not the parliament. The, like in the United States, it's the Congress that declares war. In England, it's the king that declares war. Mm -hmm. The parliament may, may need to approve a budget for it, but it's the king that declares war. Declares war. The king that is still the head of the army. That's the king. That's why you see Elizabeth doing the, the trooping of the color until she got very old. Did what? Dressed in military Outfit. Why? Because she is the, she's the, the the colonel in chief of all of the armed forces. All of them. They take allegiance to her when she was alive. They take allegiance to him, not to the country, not to the parliament, to him. So all of what you saw in parliament today, in our parliament, excuse me, in Westminster today, lends itself to understanding. It was the queen that sent the troops through to Afghanistan through her prime minister. So the prime minister pretty much said, you know, talk to her about it. And, and so pretty much the queen gives her okay, and the prime minister sends them out. Yeah, because it's the king, the queen and the king that has the final word on the military in England. Like I use, for example, when the United States invaded Grenada, or Grenada, however you want to pronounce it, Margaret Thatcher did not tell the Queen like she was supposed to. Queen Elizabeth sent an urgent message to the Prime Minister to get off her duff and come see her now. Prime Minister said, I'm busy. The Queen said, I don't give a flip. You come see me now. And they sent people to go get Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher got in that car and came to the Palace of Buckingham to answer the Queen why she didn't get notified that the United States help with a coup of a British, of a nation that she was she was the queen over. Ooh, her, her and Thatcher had it out about that. I can promise you, Thatcher didn't make that mistake again because it is the queen that is the font of all powers, all honors, and all authority. Now it's King Charles. That being said, this is why this ceremony today was so important because Great Britain, though her parliament the king in parliament is supreme, but the king gets his authority from not from parliament, from God. The reason why England exists as a nation is not because of parliament, because of God. And that's why this ceremony today is so important. This is why it is, it is enthroned in a religious ceremony, a religious ceremony from the Church of England. Before that, it was enthroned in a Catholic ceremony, 
But once they converted from Catholicism to Anglicanism, it became incorporated in the Anglican religion as the state religion. So today what you saw was a Christian church service led by the Archbishop of Canterbury together with the what they call the Dean of Westminster. The dean would be the pastor of the Westminster, Westminster Abbey, where they would anoint Charles as king behind a screen. He would take an oath on a King James Bible that got his cipher on it, and that was a King James Bible, because the King James Bible is the property in England of the king. The king owns all rights. In the, in, in outside of England, it is in public domain. In England, it is forever in the copyright of the monarchy, the King James Bible. Some of y'all didn't know that. So, yeah, and that's important. That's important. Because the, the official worship service of the Church of England is still the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. They usually go by what they call common worship and uh, other stuff. So everything is incorporated in a worship service. So you see, the, and I keep telling people, when people are always challenging my, challenging my understanding of this stuff, they can challenge me all they want to, but they don't know. Everything that is done today, listen carefully what I'm about to say, because this is very important. Everything that was worn today and done today is based on, listen carefully what I'm about to say, the Roman imperial monarchy of the Roman Empire. i say it one more time. Everything that was done, except for the Christian part of the ceremony, all the vestments, everything. I would do my best to do that, my friend. Um, everything that was done today, everything, let's care for it. Everything that was done today has go back to the church and to the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire did things that... We today took a long time to do. It took us a long time to rediscover how they made Roman concrete. It took us a long time to understand how they made Greek fire. It took us a long time to make buildings on the level of the buildings that they made in the Roman Empire. So, but then all of a sudden, in Paris, Paris, the French said Paris, we said Paris, 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 because we pronounce the S. French said Paris, in Paris, this guy named Eiffel builds a tower that now becomes the biggest thing that humanity has done since the Roman Empire. The great one, the biggest monuments is the Roman Empire. Biggest monuments, taller than any cathedrals. Before then, all Europe was doing was building these great cathedrals. That right that's till today. It takes us years, it takes us longer time to build cathedrals today on the level they did in the Middle Ages than what they did during the Middle Ages. And so the the, the crowning, the ceremonial robes, all of those stuff goes back to remind people that England is just as great as the Roman Empire. And the reason why we know this. Because some of you don't understand the thing about a crown. The Elizabeth wore something that was masculine and y'all didn't even know it. She wore what they call, I believe it's called a St. Edward's tiara. Or I think it's St. Edward's tiara. The tiara that goes all the way around your head that Elizabeth wore most of the time, that if you look on the money, she got a picture. That's a masculine tiara. Because the feminine tiara has the little comb-shaped things that push it into the hair, always open in the back, got the little thing that stands up at the front. That's the feminine tiara. But the masculine tiara is what kings wore when they were when they were not the highest authority. Remember, an emperor is higher than a king. Well, what was the difference between an emperor's crown and a king's crown? Well, an emperor's crown had what we call arches. Charlemagne, arches. That represented an emperor. That means nobody could rule over you. So England never called her king emperor until the Indian, until the time they took over India. But they did call, informally called their emperor, I mean king emperor, because the crown that he wore after he put, after he was crowned in the St. Edward's crown, he put, had, he had to put on then 
the imperial Roman Empire state crown. So they literally called the king emperor without calling him emperor by putting on a crown on his head that had arches. All of this goes back to the Roman Empire to say that Great Britain is literally a continuation of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was both what? An imperial thing and a democracy at the same time. Whew, that's why it's not so good to study history. So then, one of the things that, king, that kings used to wear was an imperial dominic. The king, the first thing you saw them put it when they took off the robe of the state, that long robe, red velvet robe, purple robe. She had the purple, he had the red velvet on. And it, it was trimmed in ermine fur with the little black tails in it. Well, he took, that's called a robe of a state. And they was sitting in the chairs of a state. Before he could sit on the, the chair of St. Edward's and be crowned, he had to remove everything that remind you. Uh, this is a, Pope is a little different monkey. The Pope is a little different monkey. And that's, that we can talk about that. We talk about it another time. May talk about it later. Pope is a whole different monkey, my friend. And so the king takes off the robe of estates, leaves the chair of estate, and he stand, he, st he, st he sits on the throne in just the white shirt that was underneath his coat, that purple, red, reddish purple coat he had on, and he sits down. And they anoint his head, his hands, his ears, his chest, and I think they may have known his feet. I'm not sure. But they anoint him. Why? This represents the Holy Spirit descending as a dove on the king slash emperor to anoint him to rule over this nation. Thus doing what? Providing continuity for the kingdom. Did y'all catch that? Thus providing continuity. It literally means... If the king is alive, the kingdom still lives. If the king is alive, the kingdom still lives. I can go and prove this from the Bible, but I ain't got time. I may have time a little bit later. I can prove that from the Bible. It has to do with David. When David was dying and they threw the virgin on him and he didn't get up and have sex with the virgin. And they said, oh, yet the king is dead. The kingdom is doomed because the king won't have sex. It's a whole thing. We don't think like that today. But see, that's why you got to stop listening to people who put a Western spin on an Eastern book called the Bible. So in order to understand a lot of stuff, you got to understand this. So then, what happens? The king is anointed. After he's anointed, uh, after he's anointed, guess what they do next? They remove the screen because they need everybody to see him. They're going to vest him as a deacon, a priest, and a bishop. What did all the bishops wear? Copes. Where did those copes from? Come from the Roman the Roman vestiture of the aristocracies and the empire, they, it, it, was, it, it stopped. And then the monks start wearing these copes in the 800s. And eventually the bishops adopted wearing the copes again and all that. Well, it, so it, they, the monks started re-wearing re -wearing what it was worn in the ancient Roman Empire. And then, um, and then the king started wearing, they, they eventually get to the church. Well, England did something again that the Roman Empire does. And some of y'all don't even realize this. The English church for a long time, there had been tension between the king and the English church and the Pope. Some of y'all think that, that, that Henry just did something willy nilly. No. If you study the history of the church in England and its relationship with the Pope, it's always been rocky since the Pope sent Augustine to take over the church that was already in England and Ireland. He sent St. Patrick to Ireland. He sent uh, St. Augustine to England to take over the church that was already there and Romanize the church. So from that time until Henry, there's always been tension between the king and the church. Because if the king is king, and remember, he's emperor, even though he doesn't call himself that, nobody else is supposed to be ruling. Listen carefully. Nobody else is supposed to be ruling over anything in a king's empire, but a king. The Pope claims the right to rule over the Catholic Church in England. And the kings before Henry found a way around that rule. Basically what they did is they kept paying the popes. They, they were paying the Pope, and as long as they paid the Pope, the Pope said, okay, you can name the cardinals, you can name the bishops, because they was already doing this. See, people think Henry just started it, but they don't read the real history of England. 
the kings was already paying the Pope to name these peoples. And so Henry got smart. Well, if you don't want to agree with me getting, and people think Henry, Henry never got a divorce. Let me clear that muddy water up. Henry never got a divorce. Oh, I know y'all thought he did. Father, before we move on, I, pr I lift up chosen 177, God. I pray, God, that you will work in her life and her children's life to provide for them, God, uh, not on a home, but food to eat. You are a way maker, and if you can do it for us, I know you can do it for them. So, Father, we stand on your word. We declare it so. God, in Jesus' name, amen. And if you anywhere near Metro Atlanta, I don't know if you are, but they got places, churches that are giving out food. I don't know where they are, but I heard it on the radio that they are giving away free food uh, all the way until Mother's Day. So if you are, so you have to contact these mega church. They mention the names. Uh, I don't care for Jamal Bryant, but his church is one of those giving away food. Beulah is giving away food, I know of. I'm not sure if it's today, but you can contact them. They do have programs that can help you get back on your feet. And all that. I don't know these churches personally, but I know from the news they've been putting on the radio, they've been doing something special for mothers and, mo and mothers and children for towards Mother's Day. So if you go look, if you're in the Metro Atlanta area, just contact them and they will help you. I promise you that they got something going on. They got something going on because I know I've been hearing on the radio about Mother's Mother Day weekend and stuff like that. Anyway, going back to what I was saying, what part was I at? Because I stopped in the middle of it. Yeah. So nobody put the rules. So, in, so Henry never got a divorce. I know they told you Henry, the Roman Catholics were quick to say, well, Henry wanted to, got a divorce. No, Henry never got a divorce from his wife. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you because it's going to shock you. Charles is the first king of England who to have been divorced and become king. Yeah. Henry never got a divorce. How do you know this? Yeah, it was a big Bible. It had to, it's a King James Bible. And if you look at the, the, the spine of the Bible, it has this royal cipher on the side of it. Now, I know y'all said they taught y'all King Henry got a divorce. No, he didn't. King Henry had two ex-wives that outlived him. He, look at this. I want let me put it on my screen so y'all can see. This is what Henry actually got. Henry never got a divorce. He got this right here. Because the Church of England did not approve of divorces until the um till right before Charles was got permission to marry Camilla, maybe a few years before that, did the Church of England. So Henry got an annulment. That's the word right there on the screen at the top. It's going to disappear in less than one minute. Henry got an annulment from his wives. Henry never divorced. So the Catholic Church will lie and tell you Henry left us because he wanted to divorce his wife. Henry, the, the church that Henry was the king over, did not believe in divorce until the 1900s. I think it was 1900s. But not, yeah, 1900, either 1980s or 1990s when the law was changed. And the church now accepted people that have divorced to get remarried. So Charles is the first king of, Eng of Great Britain, because he's not technically king of England. He's king of Great Britain to have been divorced. Henry was never divorced. Henry had his previous marriages annulled. <clears throat> because at Henry's day, the church did not believe in divorce. And the reason why I bring up Henry, because Henry is important. Henry made, had the parliament. Henry is one of the few kings who told the parliament to do something, and they did it. Why did they do that? Why did they do what Henry said, but they wouldn't do what a lot of other people said? Because Henry did stuff that they like. Henry did stuff they like, and they did stuff Henry liked. So because Henry respected them and gave them the right to govern certain things, when Henry needed something done, they did it. When Henry said, let's lead the Catholic Church, the Parliament acquiesced and did what Henry said to do. When Henry said, give me my annulment, they gave him his annulment. When Henry says, uh, make me the supreme governor of the church, the Parliament did. Because Henry did something in his day that kings and queens after him wished they had authority, which is, the force to, the, if they said something, the parliament jumps right then. Because Henry knew how to manage the parliament and give them the respect that they wanted. And they, when they gave, since they gave, since he gave them the respect they wanted, they gave him whatever he wanted as king. 
That's very important to understanding the British system. Now, let's keep going. Henry asked them to make him supreme govern, supreme head of the church. Excuse me, I said the wrong word. Supreme head of the church. Why is this title so important? Because Henry, remember the, the crown that Henry and the, the kings wear since Edward has the arches in it, right? Emperor. The emperor of Rome was the head of the imperial religion. Did y'all catch that, right? Well, Henry was not technically the head of the religion in his empire. The Pope was the head of the religion through the Cardinal, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, Parliament is fixing to change that. Parliament is getting ready to reflect back on Imperial Roman Empire. And with by Henry's command, they made Henry the supreme head of the church. They made Henry something that Constantine was. What was Constantine? He was Episcoporum Secularum, means secular or world bishop. What happened today when Charles got crowned? Charles got dressed like he was a member of the priesthood of the Anglican Church. He, got, he wore a super tunica or a dalmatic, golden, with a belt around it. That open up technically is considered even as a super tunic or a dalmatic. Even though it doesn't look like one. It, that's what it was being. He get, then they put on him what? A girdle or a cincher around his waist. It's a girdle, like a cincher around his waist. He can put his sword in. Like the cincher hangs down over the left leg. Why? Because the sword hangs down over the left, left leg. Uh-huh. What do they put on the king neck? They put on him a stole with crosses on it, symbols of the church and symbol of his empire that he ruled over. Why? Because a priest wear a stole. What is a stole? The stole is the scarf of office. So they put on him a priest stole. The last thing they put on him is a cope. Now, a cope, anybody can wear a cope. But when you put a mitre on your head, it becomes Episcopal. But they didn't put a mitre on the king's head. They put a crown on his head. So they gave him an imperial cope to wear. And then they then he sat down on the chair and the head of the, the, the spiritual head of the Anglican church came over to a king dressed as the natural or secular head of the Anglican church and the head of the, the kingdom of England, the kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and his other realms and dominion and head of the commonwealth, defender of the faith. He placed a mitre, a crown on the king's head. And he steps back a few steps and says, long live the king. Thereby saying, we have just did the ordination ceremony. Because that's what a coronation is. It's an ordination ceremony to ordain the king as king and episcopal secularum. The head of the church the head of the country, by divine right. But in order for him to rule by divine right, he had to take several oaths from the chair of his state. And then he had to sign those oaths. That's why you saw the last thing he did after he took those oaths that was given by the archbishop. They sent him a document in a thing and he signed it. Charles R. Charles Rex. He literally said... I agree to buy by the laws of this country and govern this nation through my prime minister based on what he gives me as the dictates of parliament. That's what he says. I agree to execute those laws. What do George Biden, not George Biden, what do uh, President Biden does? He execute the laws. He does what the king does. He execute the laws that are made by parliament. The only difference between Biden and the king is that the king can only make certain laws up by himself. He cannot make all of them. The issue is that the king must be anointed by God. And it is said that God gave the Archbishop of Canterbury anointed oils from heaven to anoint Elizabeth I as queen. And that subsequent oils that was made 
was mixed with that oil to anoint Charles as king. Charles did not want the current oil used because that oil they normally would use has animal fat in it. So Charles wanted anointing oil based on how the Bible said it be made. And since his mama, not his mama's group, since his grandmother was a Greek Orthodox person, not grandmother Queen Mary or Queen Elizabeth, but his grandmother from his paternal side, father's side, was Greek Orthodox. And since she was Greek Orthodox, he asked the Greek Orthodox Church to make anointing olive oil based on the biblical precepts and blessed by him as well as the, the Anglican Bishop of Jerusalem for his anointing. So that was the purpose of that, is to give him oil from Jerusalem to anoint him as king. To anoint him as king. So everything that you saw happen today, happened today to ordain Charles as king by God's right and the will of his people and that Charles agree to govern the kingdom based on the wishes of parliament how the parliament does it through the current whatever whoever is the current prime minister that's why you saw the prime minister read scripture even though he's a Hindu he reads scripture. Why? Because everything the king does, majority of what he does must be done through. <laughs> I like history and I don't try to be biased. Like the humanist guy was trying to come on here and be biased. I don't like to be biased because they want to try to put a humanistic spin to it. And there's no humanistic spin to this. Um, I just told you, uh, chosen one, what to do. You can get food real quick if you call those churches. Call the churches. People will give quickly to a church than to someone with a cash up. I can promise you that. That's no shade. Because if you go through a church, I promise you, you get better help than asking somebody here through cash up. Because unless people know you or either know something about you, people are reluctant to do that. It, it doesn't matter if you're homeless or not. People, are, trust me, I know by experience, people are reluctant to do it and all that because they think you're fake. But if you go through a church, I promise you, you get help. Now, I'm going to tell you how I do. When I go, when I'm riding in my car and I stop at a store and somebody said, I'm homeless, could you help me? You know the first thing I do? I said, could you get in my car, get in the back seat of my car? I'm going to take you to the, to the, uh, to the restaurant right across the street. No, sir, just give me the money. No, we're going to take you to the restaurant. You just said you were hungry, right? I'm going to buy you as much as you can eat plus something to eat later on. They said, no, I just rather have the money. Then you're not hungry. So that's the attitude most people say. If we offer you to go somewhere and you don't go there, people think you're fake because they're looking for you to go take the aid and get the aid. And their people area, their Salvation Army will help you with food. And so I'm I'm the kind of person that would do that, I, unless you're a church or a ministry. I'm going to autumn, I'm going to pick you up, and I'm going to take you to go get food. I can't do it now. My car broke down. I got to figure I'm going to get my car fixed now, and all of that. But uh, but uh, that's what I do. I don't never give people. The last time I gave somebody money at a grocery store at a and I was it was a convenience store. The dude said, "Give give me a couple of dollars so I can go in and get me something to eat." I gave the cat $5 instead of going inside the store. He done took off going across, walking down Memorial Drive. Where he went, he probably went to go get him some drugs or something. It's probably somebody doing a scam because if she if she's not listening and trying to keep pushing cash up, because last time somebody did that, they were trying to scam people out of money and all that. Unless they are somebody that is uh, reputable, you know, because... Last time I gave somebody my cash up over a thing like that. Oh, she always asks for money. Well, she is just remove her from the chat, then. She always asks for money. Just remove her from the chat and all that because that's a scam, then. So, um, what were we talking about? Yeah. So, everything that was done today to, was to reinforce the idea that God has ordained the kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to exist. And that God maintains its existence by maintaining the monarchy. 
and that the, the right of parliament to rule comes from the king through God. It comes from the king. It comes from the God through the king. So that's what you saw happen today. And the reason why I brought up tradition, because tradition, church folk think tradition is a bad word. Tradition is the glue that hold the family together. I'm going to say it one more time. Tradition is the glue that holds a family together. When you lose the glue that holds your family together, you see your family fall apart. You see your family stop observing certain traditions. People, if you, uh, to prove my point, how many times have you looked at these non-denominational churches? And you say, wow, they grew real big, then they fizz out and they die. But they preached against the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church still got traditions, still got traditional worship, still got program worship, and they've been going on for almost 2,000 years now. But yet your church came along, people prophesying, speaking in tongues. We don't observe traditions here, come as you are. But your church only lasts about 20 years and it fizzles out and it dies. And it becomes a byword or a hashtag and nobody remembers it no more. Then the next church grows up and does what your church did. Oh, we don't believe in tradition. We don't believe in this and that and third. And your church grows. It gets to a point where it reaches its maximum potential. It dies and fizzles out. And then it disappears and it no longer. Okay, you know why? Because it has nothing in it. That holds the people together. You know why God really told Israel to deserve Ten Commandments? Not Ten Commandments, excuse me. The feasts. He told them to deserve the feasts because those feasts became the glue that held them together as a nation. Christians have feasts. We don't celebrate the Hebraic feasts. We celebrate those things that are important to our redemption in Christ Jesus. So when you lose sight of your tradition, you lose the glue that holds your family together. I wouldn't say exactly like that uh, because, again, Roman Catholic Church is full of tradition and traditionalism and it's still still growing. It ain't dying yet. The problem is, is when the problem, my friend, is literally this. Jesus says the problem. Jesus says when your traditions supersede the word of God. And what? How did Jesus explain that? Well, they changed the law. How did they change the law? They said that the law says, the law said, love your mom and daddy. Honor them. Well, they said, well, I don't have to see my parents to honor them. All I have to do is send a gift in their name. Jesus says, your tradition, what tradition? Tradition concerning the law. The law says to honor your father. It literally means to go see them, to honor them face to face. It didn't say they had to be right or did right, but you said to honor them. Well, you didn't like your parents because they was abusive, this and this. And so you said, well, I'll send a gift in their name to honor them. Jesus said that was not the intent of the law. You have nullified the law by your traditions. See, people like John Eckhart would say, oh, that's the tradition of men to wear vestments in the church. Well, that's not what Matthew is talking about. Matthew is literally talking about changing something in the word of God to render what the word of God says a non-effect. So the Bible never said I could not have tradition or be traditional or even to have traditionalism. The Bible simply says that what I do cannot nullify the Word of God. So me wearing investments in church does not nullify the Word of God. Me having ceremonials in church, like they did today in England, does not nullify the Word of God. What nullifies the Word of God, when I ch like the oneness count, would change the clear meaning of Acts 2.38 from the authority of Jesus to being baptized in Jesus' name. That's a violation of the word. That's your tradition rendering the word of God in none effect. Because Jesus never said that the name of God is Jesus. He said the name of God in Hebrew would have been Hashem, which is uh, which is uh, Yahweh. So Jesus' bare name as father would be Yahweh is salvation, which is Jesus. He say us is Yahweh is salvation. So that's the point. So we got churches out there that have rendered the word of God in none effect. You got churches like Geno Genesis 
who don't preach any gospel because they have literally rendered the word of God in effect by telling women they must sit separately from men's in church. They tell him, uh, you that uh, um, buck dancing is is uh, is sexualized dancing. Can't dance in the church where David danced. Uh, he tells you, um, he lies in church and tells you that Caesar Begoria is what Jesus, the image of Jesus based on which, no, the, there are images of Jesus way before Caesar Begoria. And he goes on to tell you that the Christmas tree of Jeremiah chapter 10, they, it couldn't be Jeremiah chapter 10 because there was no Christmas tree that was arriving at that time. So these people render the word of God of non-effect with their false teachings. So tradition is the glue that holds the family together. My great grand, great aunt died, and everything that we knew about the Sloan family died with her. Only the bits and pieces that we know survived, but she knew all the secrets. She could tell you, she knew how my, my family migrated from upstate, from upstate somewhere between Pennsylvania and, and Maryland, all the way down into, how we got all the way down into, um, on my mama's side, into uh, Georgia, middle Georgia, around the Plains, Blake, Plains, not Plains, the Blakely, Georgetown, uh, Cuspid area, and 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 uh, whatever the little city south of Cuspid is, all the way into Dawson. She can tell you that. I can't tell you that. But she knew our parents' side. She knew who who we were, what slave what uh, slave master owned who before we got set free, and everything else. She knew all of that. I don't know all of that. You you lose when you lose tradition, you lose the glue that holds your family together. And all that. if you look at churches, any church that has survived more than 50 years has some traditional elements that holds their church together that they do. And they're very careful when they bring a new pastor in to make sure that pastor would not break those traditional elements that holds the church together. So, you know, that's what I look at. You can preach truth and yes, they have tradition. But some of y'all building churches that are not going to last. Some of y'all are building churches that are not going to last more than 20 years after you die. If that much. If that much. Because you have no traditions that could hold that church together. The same here. My grandmother talks about family all the time. Even the, uh, I can't even pronounce that. In, I don't, I'm not even trying to mess that side up and all of that. So that that's the point. And a lot of churches, especially Pentecostal churches, they love to fight something in ignorance. They, they in their ignorance, will fight traditions and don't realize that it's not the tradition that you fight. You fight the areas where we have rendered the word of God of no effect in the life of people. That's what we fight. So the Jewish nation lasts long because they kept their traditions. But you see Christians fighting Christmas, they fight Easter, and no wonder the Muslims are gaining ground. No wonder the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are gaining the Mormons, they're gaining ground because the Christians fighting traditions. Okay, so the king just changes to something purple. Does that mean something? If you're talking about his regular his regular coat that he had on when he came in was purple. And then after they crown him and they take all that stuff out, he's going to put that stuff back on. He's going to put his original guard back on together with the robe of a state. So when you see the king after the coronation with the crown on, he's going to always have on the robe of a state together, just like the Roman emperors did. The Roman emperors wore a robe of a state. So you're going to see the king, when he opened parliament, if he does like he's supposed to do, he's supposed to come into parliament in his regular clothes. They're going to change him into his robe of state and put the crown on his head, and he will process into parliament with the robe of state because he's sitting on a banner in parliament that has something to do with king having divine authority from God. So if you notice, the other thing you notice too, even though it wasn't really, even though it wasn't really noticeable, 
but that little yellowish gold area that they sit on, that was an elevated platform. The only thing they did today that you didn't that you you couldn't tell it because it was made like a ramp going up. Because a chair is not a throne unless it is on an elevated platform. So then when you go in Parliament, the reason why that chair is called a throne, because it sits on an elevated platform. That's why it's called a throne. A throne does not sit on the floor. When it sits on the floor, it is a chair of a state. When it's on the platform, it's a throne. Oh, wow. In Lego land. <laughs> oh, so you in Florida then, huh? Because Lego, I know there's a Lego land in Florida. I'm not sure if there's one outside of that, outside of Florida. So, yeah, it's a color chair. They may have one in California. You are in California. So they may have one in California because usually where Disneyland is, there are other amusement parks too. So they, have one, they should have one in California. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's a throne. Um, Carlsbad. Okay, Carlsbad, California. So this is the key. How many times have you ever heard Bishop saying, I'm being enthroned? If the bishop chair is not on an elevated platform, he's not being enthroned. He's being installed. A throne is on an elevated platform. A regular chair is on the floor. On a, I'm, I'm same here, my nephew woke me. I missed it. I was supposed to wake up this morning, but I was still disappointed. I got to figure out what I'm going to do about my car. And uh, because... My car is one of the ways how I made money. And now the transmission is messed up again. I don't know what's going on with that. And because of uh, some things that happened with my ex-wife, I'm having a hard time trying to get another car loan. And so I need y'all prayers on that. And uh, I need y'all prayers seriously on that. <coughs> because, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Because I got to figure out how we're going to do this. How we're going to do this. And, um, oh, Jesus, I messed up my thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. This man talking about he was up late. <coughs> I was trying to, but I didn't get up until, um, I think about 10 or 11 o'clock when I got up. <coughs> and then, um, when I got up, and it's hot in this room, that's why I'm coughing. It is hot again, I need to cut some air on here. And, um, me and my kids were supposed to be at the park today. And, um, I didn't get a chance to work to make enough money to go to the park. I didn't get a chance to finish working to make enough money to go to the park. <coughs> and my car tore up. And so, my kids and and my grand oldest grandson were disappointed. My daughter cried, y'all. My daughter cried, made me cry, cause I didn't get a chance to go to Albany this weekend as I had planned to go. And the money I got, gotta go pay bills until I get my car fixed. And I don't know how I'm gonna do all that, but y'all, I'm not worried. The Lord is gonna make a way out of no way, somehow, some way on that. But anyways, let's go back to talking about what we're talking about. Um, Christmas is not, the word Christmas is not in your Bible. The word Christmas, it comes from the church. It means, it comes from England, actually. It's come from England because in England is where the word Christmas first appeared at. The word Christmas is made up of two words, Christe Missy. It's Latin for Christ's Mass. It comes from Great Britain. It does not come from the Roman Catholic Church per se. It comes from Great Britain and the English Church. Um, the Roman Catholic Church calls it the Nativity of Our Lord. We in English would say Noel. On the first Noel, the angels did say, literally on the first birthday of our Lord, Noel. Um, the church celebrated Christmas before there was a feast of the Invincible Son by Emperor Aurelius. Matter of fact, again, we have the decrees of the emperors. And Emperor Aurelius instituted a uh, soul invictus in response to the Christians celebrating Christmas. The tradition of celebrating Christmas on December 25th comes from an ancient um, ancient tradition. Um, 
I think it's Hebraic tradition, if I'm not mistaken, that says that the day you die on, if you count nine months later, is the day that you was born on. So according to the Roman calendar, Jesus would have died March the 25th, which will correspond to Nisan 14 on the Jewish calendar. And if you count nine months from that, you get December the 25th. <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether Jesus was born 25th or not. We celebrate his birthday on that. Some people try to say Jesus was born in September or mid-October because of the Feast of Tabernacles. But what they do not do when they say that, they do not take into account the course of priests that John's father, Zacharias, would have been a part of. That course of priests would have served twice in a year. One of those times that they served, if you count nine months from that day, and you factor in Elizabeth being pregnant six uh, six months by the time she met, uh, uh, not Elizabeth, uh, yeah, Elizabeth being pregnant at least six months by the time she met Mary. That means that if you factor in all the time, then there's only two times a year that Jesus could have been actually born. One is the month we celebrate Easter in. So there's some people that believe Jesus was born probably Nisan first. Because that's the first day of the month he died in. That's people like myself. Um, then there are other schools thought that put Jesus' birth somewhere because, again, the second course of priests would have put Jesus' birth somewhere in August or September but not late September to correspond to the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> it doesn't matter that he would, it doesn't matter when he was born. The, what matters is that he was born and the church does what the Bible says. What did the Bible say? Whatever you make laws on earth, God said, I make law in heaven. <clears throat> so the church gave us 25th based on an ancient tradition that says that a person was born nine months from the day they died. On the same day they died, nine months before they were born, nine months from that on the same day in that month. So March 25th, nine months later, December 25th. That's how we get it. It doesn't matter. People say, well, it would have been cold. That's a lie. That is a lie. It is definitely cold in England during that time. Yes, it is still cold in England at that time. Yes, you see, you didn't know the temperature. You just believe some Western Christian that were trying to debunk the Bible, but they didn't have their history right. And they didn't have their, their weather patterns right. Yes, it would have been cold that time. And yes, shepherds would have been keeping their sheep out at that time as well. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. He could have been born. What we do know is that even if he wasn't born that date, guess who could have showed up that date? Because if you look at all the times, by the time of the age and the time that they came, you figure it out. Nine times to ten, though he may not have been born on the 25th, he met the wise men around that time. And it's a way to calculate that. I don't have it in front of me, but trust me, I got books on that stuff. And all of that got stuff downloaded on this, not on this computer, but I got several different laptops, but they're in storage that I have to actually go get, plug them up, charge them up, and connect them because the screen don't work. Either I got to get a new screen or hook them up to my TV, my TV that's behind me. And um, I can pull up the articles about it, but trust me, um, <laughs> When people try to refute stuff, they refute it. They try to refute it because they want to be Hebraic and they want to observe the Jewish feast. The Jewish feast was type and shadow to what we have. We don't keep the shadows. We keep the reality. Paul says that those feasts are weak and miserable and we as Christians keep the reality of the shadows. So the, the feast of Pentecost was about giving of the law and making Israel a nation. The Feast of Pentecost for Christians is about making us a, the people, God, the redeemed people of God, and about writing the law of God on our hearts, not Ten Commandments, but on our hearts, and making us a new generation, a, the generation of a new Adam, which is Jesus, and reversing the Tower of Babel and all of that. So we have a different reason why we celebrate Pentecost. We got a different reason why we celebrate Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb now. So we don't keep the Jewish Passover. Uh, we kept the Jewish Passover, we're saying that what? Messiah has not come. So we don't keep the Jewish Passover, we keep the Christian Passover. Because Paul said, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Let us keep that feast. 
he couldn't say it about the Jewish Passover because Christ was not the lamb that they sacrificed. That lamb type and shadow Jesus. Jesus did die in Nisan 14, the day before Nisan 15, the day that by that time Passover was actually celebrated on, <clears throat> which is why this Saturday is called the High Sabbath and all that. So Jesus dies on Friday. All four gospels says he died on Friday. It tells us Saturday is the high Sabbath. Nisan 15 would have been the high Sabbath that day. Even though the Bible said Passover is 14, by the time Jesus is alive, you study your history because 15 is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. By the time Jesus is alive, both Passover and Unleavened Bread had merged into one feast. So Jesus does die. That's why it seems like there's confusion in the text. It's only confusing because some of y'all don't know the history behind the text. That's why it seems like one party said Passover, one said in preparation for Passover. Why? Because by Jesus' day, though Moses' law said the Passover was on the 14th, they didn't sacrifice until the 15th by that time. Yeah. And they start around in the afternoon and go on. So while, so while they did sacrifice the lamb on the 14th, but by Jesus' day, they're doing it on the 15th. And we know this be fact, because by the time we get to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, what were they doing? On Nisan 15, they sacrificed almost 300,000 lambs on that day because that's how many people showed up. That's about how many people showed up for the feast. Well, how many people showed up with a lamb? It was. It said it was over a million people there. But about 300 brought a lamb to be sacrificed that day. And you know, the lambs have to be checked and without blemish. So only 300, some made, almost 289,000, I think they said, plus made it to be kosher enough to be sacrificed that day. And they started around one in the afternoon, something like that. They started real early afternoon and they went all the way until late night sacrificing those lambs because there were just so many there. So blood was everywhere. Water was everywhere because they had a, a natural spring that sprung up into the temple that they brought into the temple to clean it up and stuff like that. So then we keep Easter. Easter is the English word. And Easter is, has nothing to do with Ishtar. People lie and say that all the time. Easter and Ishtar are not the same thing. Ishtar was a Mesopotamian deity. Easter does not come from Ishtar. Matter of fact, let me tell you what's so stupid about people comparing the two. What's so stupid about it is this. The only record we have of Easter is from a Christian who writes about Easter. His name is Deacon Bede, B-E-D-E. -E. Sometimes he's called a ver ver verbenable Bede. Sorry, I got a, a stuttering tongue, so some syllables are hard for me to pronounce. And so he writes about it. So all we know about Easter Ostara, which is where Easter comes from. It means East, where we get where East from. It also means spring, East and spring. We know from him, and he doesn't tell us a whole lot. So it's a shame that that ninjas and, nigger, and ninjarets, as well as our pale-faced brothers, can invent so much about a deity that we don't have much information about. And we all we have is what the deacon told us. So how are you going to take somebody... That dude right there, thank you. He was a deacon. He was a deacon in the church. That's why he's called Venerable, because he's a deacon. And um, he's the only person that gives us information about Ostara. That Ostara means spring and east. It was a deity of ancient it was a deity of ancient Germanic people. And the reason why the month is called Easter Monte, because Easter means spring. And what happens in April? Spring. New life, spring. So we got a lot of ninjas out here pontificating with lies because they don't like Christianity. So instead of studying, they'll pontificate a lie instead of pontificating the truth because they don't like Christianity. Just They won't admit it, but they just tell the truth. We just don't like Christianity and all that. The problem is, he's the only source. So it doesn't matter where he got it from. What matters is, he's the only source. It's just like when we talk about the Roman Empire. Much of what we know about the Roman Empire only comes from about two or three sources that can date back to that time. So then, when we talk about sources, 
you have to look at it. We got more external sources for the Bible <laughs> and for Jesus than we do for the Roman Empire. But people don't know that because they haven't studied. They haven't studied. So, you know, like when I quote, when I talk about the Roman emperors, if I was to come here and say, and I got, and I told y'all where to find this at. Matter of fact, I gave y'all one of my books before I told y'all get my book because you get this book. Yeah, it's called, it's going to cost some change, but it got, it's my research. Get my book. This book has a link to all the imperial codes of the Roman emperors as it relates to religion. Because when people start pontificating lies, they'll tell you, like the oneness church will tell you, Constantine gave us the Trinity. And I look at them and said, that's a lie. And they try to argue with me. I said, that's a lie. Constantine did not give us the Trinity. Show me a code, a religious code, because we got them. And then they shocked when I said, we got the religious codes. Show me among the religious codes of the Roman emperor and the emperor saying, Constantine saying that he gave us the Trinity. Because there's none. Because he didn't. He didn't. And we got we got records of the Nicene Council. He didn't. But we, we know which emperor did decree something about the Trinity. We, matter of fact, it was two emperors and a Caesar. We have their three names. We have the edict, edict that they gave us, the edict of Thessalonica, uh, which says that it mentioned those three names and says that the only religion that would be the state religion of the empire would be Nicene Christianity as practiced by the Roman bishop and the, the um, it says the Roman pontiff, I think it actually says, and it says the bishop of Alexandria that confesses one God in Trinity, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, shall be called Catholic Christians or Nicene Catholic Christians actually. And anybody that will not accept this religion, God and us will deal with them according to how we decide. And he also says, if you do not confess these faith, you will be called heretic. Heretic. It's one of my syllabus that I uh, that I wrote. And uh, if you give me a minute, I'll look it up real quick to see exactly which one is. I told y'all before, but it's been a while since I actually brought that up. to see which one I actually put it in. I know I put it in one of them because I actually told everybody so they could actually get it. It had more information than that in it. But uh, I think it was my 2016 one. Let me see if I find a record of it. But it has all those decrees. So when people start telling you stuff, always go back to the source and find the most earliest source you can find. That's why when I did my research on Christmas and Easter, I didn't go to any source that was Christian hating or Christian affirming, if you will. I tried to find the source that was the most unbiased as possible. And when I start looking at the unbiased source that really didn't have an uh, iron in the fire, you start finding out that a lot of people are pontificating stuff based on people who didn't like what happened. And though I am a Judeo-Christian believer, my faith is Judeo-Christian. I have to be honest and say that Jews back then did not like Christians. Why did not Jews like Christians back then? It was simple. The Roman Empire started to favor the Christian religion over the Roman Empire. Yeah, Eusebius, and him and a few others, you can find some of these codes that I mentioned. You can find it because they actually quote some of this stuff. And uh, But there was two guys that actually took the chance, I think two of them, that took the opportunity to compound, compile, excuse me, all of the imperial religious codes in one book. And when you find those things, then it changes your opinion of some of this stuff. That's why I don't follow everybody that claim to be a Christian. I don't, will not, refuse to, will not follow them in this life or the next. Okay, which one it is? You're going to have to give me a moment here. I know it's in one of my books because I know I told them. I told everybody which book it was. And I showed it to them. Mm -hmm. Y'all know what? How long I've been on this thing? Because if it's too big, 
somebody asked me to upload it if the file is too big, it's going to take me a long time to upload it. Let's see. I think it's either in my 2015 book or my 2016 book that I put in it because I did a whole lesson on it. Um, oh, 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 I haven't brought that lesson up in a long time. I need to bring that one back. I definitely need to bring that one back. Oh, it ain't in this one. Let me see. Can I, let me see. Hold on, hold on. Hey, the gold rope they put on the king, does that mean something? Yeah, I explained that a little bit earlier when I was talking about how they dressed him. The first garment will be akin to a dalmatic. It's called a super tunica dalmatic. It's a dalmatic, actually, uh, because the Roman emperors wore a dalmatic. And then the next thing you see them put him on was a girdle around his waist, which represent the censure but not in the sense that a censer represents a girdle that's chastity. This is a censer that holds his sword in, the sword of state in. And, uh, you'll see that, but they, they should see you, see, show them handing it to him, and he actually put it around his waist. The next thing they will put on him is a golden stole with cross on him because he's dressed like a priest. And then they get him the robe that you saw, which is a cope. Like the bishops wear copes, like all those bishops are wearing copes. So that's him vesting as a bishop. And the last thing they put on him is the crown or mitre on his head to represent his imperial authority. Well, this is they're crowning him as king in the in the line of Saint Edward the Confessor, because the crown is supposed to be an image, a mirror of the crown that Saint Edward the Confessor wore, who is buried behind that altar in a big thing. But then, technically, also they invest him as bishop, anointed by God to be the secular bishop of the empire like Constantine was the secular bishop of the Roman Empire. Hold on, hold on. Give me just I need to turn my internet on so I can get on this thing. Hold on just a minute. Okay, live network is unstable. <laughs> Y'all hold on just a minute. Hopefully it should stabilize in just a minute. Let me see. Y'all hold on just a minute. My thing is unstable because I tried to connect my internet up from the farm. I probably should have did this. Brian Carnes is a mixture between oneness and Trinitarian. How do I know that? Because I talked to him. Brian Carnes was raised Trinitarian, but because he hang around a lot of oneness people and a lot of those oneness people help finance his program, he is technically oneness. Okay. Why is this thing? I can. Okay, there we go. I should be back. So, sorry about that. My thing, but Brian Carnes is one of my friends. I got his personal phone. I got one of his many phone numbers. <laughs> and uh, but he's a he's a cross between oneness and um, Trinitarian. He was baptized in Jesus' name, but he will confess Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How that makes sense, I don't know. And I'm, give me a moment, I'm trying to look up my book, name, and all that, so I had to go online, so in order to find my thing, I had to go online. Uh, I think that's it, because I put some, ooh, ooh, I think I know where it's at. Hold on, I'm doing this. I mean, I have to do that, because it's in my uh, downloads. I actually download, I think, from my email. I think that's how I was able to show it from this computer. Co-app 
Let's see. Yep, it sure is. Here it goes right here. Let me open this up. If this is the right book, then I'll suggest the book. And um Yeah, but Brian Carnes technically is a Trinitarian parading around as a oneness. Um, he has a lot of oneness friends, and uh, he probably on my live or probably looking at it behind the scene. Because usually when I go on live and ever I mention his name, the cat always come online for some reason. And uh, then I get a phone call later on saying, Henry, why are you messing with me? <laughs> uh, but I, I met Brian Carnes a long time ago when I was still in Albany, Georgia south of here, and uh, met him online, then we met in person at Bishop uh, Morton Old Church he used to have up here before they moved to the original location they had up here, and um, Brian Carnes did this, uh, they, everybody was coming at Brian Carnes about the witch, that prophecy that he supposedly um, copied, and I was one of them, and Carnes had already been on my friends list for a while now. But never spoke to me. I don't know why he added me and all that. But he had already been on my friends list. I didn't add him. He added me. me. But long story short, Brian Carnes, after I addressed what happened, Brian Carnes uh, reached out to me and asked for my phone number and asked to talk to me. And... Uh, And because he he talked to me, and um, yeah, he called me and we talked for a long time. Matter of fact, we talked so long till it was Sunday morning, and I had not went to sleep, and I had to be at church on Sunday morning. And um, God, we had talked so long. It was a crying shame we talked so long, and. Um, Yeah, we had talked a long time. And, um, but we became friends after that, at that moment. No, and he would tell his friends. He put me on the phone with a lot of his friends, and a lot of his friends are oneness. And he had me debating his friends. He had some Baptist friends too, he had some Trinitarian friends, but he had me debating his friends. Well, long story short, he had me debating his friends, and his friends and I always end in arguing. We always did. We end in arguing because they want to, they always want to result to, you know, when you bring them proof, some of them want to say what the Holy Ghost told me. And I said, that's not enough for me. That's subjective because the Holy Ghost speaks to me too. So which one of us got the right Holy Ghost voice? That's subjective. And, you know, they would get mad. And one of his friends tried to read, prophet lie, read me. And I told the dude, I said, you can't read me, dude. He said, he tried to say, I'm crazy. I'm on uh, meds. My family on meds. And that's one reason why I act the way I act. And yada, yada, yada. And he tried to, I said, dude, everything you're saying, I hope you don't believe. Because it's a lie from the pit of hell. And, uh. And you, you're going to hell for this. You're definitely going to hell for this. And he was like, no, I'm not going to hell for this. Because I'm not lying on you. Yada, 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 yada. But he was lying. He was lying. And um, eventually what happened is, is that he and I, well, me and those guys, we hung up with each other. We hung up phone because I can't, I can't. I can't do the lies. I really can't. I really can't. And I don't know which book I put it in. Because it ain't in the 2016 book. Why is it saying... Hmm. Yeah, so...
Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I got to find that book. Y'all. I don't know which one of my books is in because the book I thought it was in, it ain't in that book. So it can't be, it has to be, let me see if I find the 2017 book. Because whatever syllabus is in, I suggested it and people, I know they went and bought it because um, it not only had that and it had a whole bunch of other good stuff in it too. But I don't see it. I don't see it. I see 2016, has to be 2017 because it could have been in 2018 book because I, and I know it was in 20. Or is it 2015? Is it 2015? Let me see. Cohab. It was in one of those books because when I did it, when I did the book, it's got to be in my email because I don't see it right there. When I did the book, I did the book because somebody asked me for it. And they asked me for, and I said, you know what? And I said, make a good teaching for my for my people in my, in my Congress. And I put it, I can't believe the pastor would be on Quran for, I can't remember the pastor that would be on Quran for hard calling him false. Oh, you talking about um, Tony Smith? Tony Smith don't even consider himself a pastor anymore. Tony Smith is a straight out heretic now. <clears throat> and uh he had me on phone with Tony Smith. Tony Smith is a nut. And I almost hate to say that, but that's really what he is. Tony Smith got on the phone and he was talking like a normal person. And Henry he said, Karen said, Henry, I want you to meet another friend of mine. I said, Oh Jesus, here we go again. He was talking like a normal man. All of a sudden, I said something that he disagreed with, and Tony Smith went to the deep end. Tony Smith started calling me out of my name, and um, yeah, he started calling me all out of my name, and I'm like, and he hung up the phone. Tony Smith hung up the phone. I kid you not, Tony Smith hung up the phone. And uh, and uh, excuse me. And um, he did. He hung out the phone on me. And um, Carl was like, um, Henry, there you go. You make boy hang up on me. I said no. And so he called him back. The moment Tony Smith heard my voice again, dude start cussing on the phone and going off again. And he hung up the phone again. <clears throat> he literally hung up the phone again. And so I told, <laughs> so I told uh, Brian Carnes, you can put that child on the phone again if you want to. If you put that child on the phone again, I'm not listening to him. <clears throat> Excuse me. I said, I'm not listening to him. I'm going to hang up the phone myself. I don't deal with men who don't know how to be men and, and childish. And soon they disagree with somebody. They start hollering like a little crazy nut. <clears throat> that man a long way from being a black Hebrew is like I can't see how them people can sit in church service and let him hold them there for about four or five hours just him running his freaking mouth I don't understand it I don't know where that thing is you know, when you send stuff to people, okay, we got that one. I'm going to have to get all of my books and uh, find them again for you guys because other, for some reason, I cannot find the right version of the book. Yeah, I can't find the right version of the book because there is supposed to be hold on let me go back through this 
19. I got 16. That should be the PDF for 16. I got PDF for 17. Do I got 18 on here? In one of my books, I got them whole all that stuff listed. I just got to find which one it is. I do apologize because normally I have all this stuff in place. I can't remember what year it was. I go 19. It can't be 19 because I don't think I did it that year. Because whatever year I did it, turn the world upside down and come here also. It can't be the book. <clears throat> I can't not that cannot be the book. <clears throat> no, that's not it. It had to be before the end because this book this book is not it. I do apologize because normally I've even had the books in reference and I can't remember what book I put it in because I know I did a live on TikTok and said which book it was in and people actually went and got the book and they went and they th told me thank you because they researched the material that I gave them and they, and they found it very good for them and um, I can't remember what book I put <coughs> Let me see. I think I downloaded 17. <sighs> oh, you think I got 18 on here? Mm. Couldn't be that year. It's one of these years because one of these years somebody asked me about it, and because they asked me about it, it's the reason why I put it in the book. <coughs> and I put it in there so that it was easy to find. Breakout section, man cave, preaching that transform. I don't know. I'm going to have to get all my books. Oh, I need to get that again. That was good. Verbum, verbum Domini, the Word of God. Why the Bible is the Word of God. We're going to do that. I got, it, I got my notes here. We're going to do a whole a teaching on that soon so you guys can understand that. Preaching that transform, it couldn't have been that. Oh. I know where it was. I know exactly where it was. I didn't put it in my main book. I I put it in my secondary book, my syllabus, midterm syllabus. You can't, I don't think you can get that one online though. The one I did when I went to, when I went to, what that place I went to at? During the pandemic, we went to we went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So the year we went to Tulsa, Oklahoma during the pandemic is when we did that. That was in twenty either that was in twenty twenty one. That's why I can't find the book. And if I had my book, I actually got the book, but it's in storage right now. I sure do. I don't know why I didn't think about that in the first place. That's why I couldn't find it in the regular book. Because I did a teaching on Constantine. And people love to say, Constantine did this and Constantine did that. And I said, and I put it in my midterm booklet. Come on, open. Says me. <laughs> That's why I don't spend about 15 to 20 minutes trying to find this. And uh, my crowd don't went down. <laughs> Let me give y'all this and I'm through. And um, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take this same book and put it on. Uh, I got to redo it. Take some people's name out of this book that I'm no longer affiliated with. And then put this book online and publish it. And um, what is that thing? Out? 
Nope, it wasn't in that one. It's in one of these. Which one it was? Oh, the one I went to California on. I think the one I went to California on. It's in one of these books. God knows it's in one of these books. Y'all see how I got I got stuff going like crazy. Can't remember half of the stuff I got. Not this year. This year is 2023. So I went to California last year. So it got to be California. Got to be that one right there. I'm going to find which one of you sooner or later. I could have swore I took that to Tulsa, Oklahoma, but I didn't. I took it to Cali. Cause went to Cal this make the second year went to Cali for midterm. Y'all give me a second. Yep, this is it. Church history, what Constantine didn't do. It's hard when you flip through your books. This book is actually online. This is the one I told everybody to go buy. So if you if you can go online, it's called Coab 2022 Midterm Book. In the book, we talk about imputed righteousness. Yeah, here we go. It's uh, one, two. It's four links from a site online that gives all the imperial religious codes from three three eleven A.D to 431 A.D., and then it cites Coleman, Horton, uh, Coleman Norton, and it cites uh, Clive Fard, Clive Farr, and it gives you the it gives you the the date that the decree was given, the source of date, like Eusebius and other people. It gives you the CN number, which is the Coleman Norton number. It gives you the name of the emperors to give you the decree, and then it gives you the summary of the document that they gave you. And so it took me a while to find this, but I got links of this in one of my books. Like I said, you can get, them all, get it online. And it goes from Constantine to Joven from Valentinian I to Theodosius I, from Arcadius and Honorarius, Council of Ephesus and the Aftermath. And it gives you all of the imperial laws as it relates to religion, especially those that relate to the Jewish and the Christian religion in the Roman Empire. Plus it tells you how to, because when people start telling you about the mystery religions, you're going to see what, what emperor expelled them out of the city and that's how they became to call pagan. They, they became to be called pagan because they were expelled out of the city. And um, because pagan at that time didn't mean heathen. Yep. And plus what you're going to see in this, and I'm going to be through because Lord knows I don't want to lose my crowd. <laughs> What you're also going to see in this, that Constantine never told them that they have to worship on Sunday. There's nowhere in these decrees that Constantine tells them they had to worship on Sundays. So when people say that, they're lying to you. The only thing that Constantine did say, and I got the decree right here in front of me. On March the 3rd, 321, Constantine decreed that all judges, inhabitants of the city, and craftsmen should rest on Sunday. But farmers are free to work on Sunday as necessary. And he did this in response to the Christians because the Christians was already worshiping on Sundays. 
So basically, he gave them a day off. That's all he did. He didn't tell them they had to worship on Sunday. He just simply said, rest. You ain't got to work. Y'all you already going to church, so take this day off. Because literally, Sunday was the day you were supposed to celebrate the emperor. I know they didn't tell y'all that when they were telling y'all that Jesus, that these folks made us worship on, on Saturday, on Sunday instead of Saturday. Saturday was a day of rest. Sunday was the day of, uh, that you went that you actually celebrated the emperor. That's the day the emperor celebrated his his birthday. That's the day you set, you did feast to the emperors. You did the, those games that the emperor celebrated and all that. And so Constantine is the first one to say, "Listen, y'all already worshiping on this day. Rest. Unless you're farmers, then you're free to work. Everybody else take a break, because that's the day that majority of people of his empire was already going to church on the day of the sun, Christmas. How you know?" Because we got record as early as 150 A.D. that tells us that the church was worshiping on Sunday. God bless you, Graham. Grace and peace. I'm trying to find something else I had here that was real good that y'all might want to digest. Constantine did something interesting that you wouldn't expect. 324, Constantine passed a law against idol worship, statues, divination, especially against pagan sacrifices. So when people start telling you Constantine brought statues in the church, he just passed a law against idol worship, statues, divination, and all that. 324 AD. This is recorded by none other than Eusebius. We know what Constantine did at the Council of Nicaea, 325. Um, Constantine is on record as having addressed the Council of Nicaea three times. The first time he discouraged the bishops from accusing one another and then burned the accusations. The second he expressed his desire that the schism caused by the Arians be healed. And third, he dismissed the Council and encouraged the use of the Nicene Creed. Interesting. Constantine, at the end of the council, encouraged all churches throughout the empire to celebrate Easter according to the ruling of the Council of Nicaea. There is no penalty for disobedience. However, basically, he didn't give us Easter, and it wasn't called Easter. It was called Passover, actually, at that time. But the Council of Nicaea had ruled that everybody should observe what we call, what they call Passover. Right? They didn't call it Easter. They called it Passover. Based on the Bishop of Alexandria. Alexandria is North Africa. So basically what Constantine did was they gave him the rules like a king does, like Charles does. Every time the Church of England make a decree, it doesn't become law until Charles decree it. So once Charles decree it, it is now law in the Church of England. This is what happened right here. That's why like when we talked about the, the crowning of Charles, in order to understand a lot of stuff that happened in history, you got to understand monarchy. Monarchy. And so that's why technically there's, even in absolute monarchies, uh, you still got advisors, people that advise you what to do. So basically, the council asked him to declare that we celebrate Passover based on what the Bishop of Alexandria said. Because that's how we celebrate Easter today, based on the Bishop of Alexandria in Egypt. Then the council asked Constantine to prepare 50 copies of the sacred scripture on well-prepared parchment. Now, parchment is not, not on scrolls, parchment, on parchment paper. That's a little bit different. They didn't ask him to do scrolls, they asked him to do parchment. Basically, it was going to be almost in a book format. The earliest way they could, because they did have some book binding as early as Constantine time. Everything was not on scrolls. Because he didn't give it. People have said, well, he told us what books were. No, he didn't. They told him because he had the money. They didn't have that money. So he says, they said, you got the ability to do it. We don't. So get your scribes to give us 50 copies of the scriptures on well-prepared parchment. And so he ordered that to happen so that they can get scriptures. Churches not paying taxes comes from Constantine. 
343, August 27th. Churches being exempt from taxes started under Constantine and also under Julian. And then the guys that said that we're supposed to be a Trinitarian religion, Gratian, Valentinian II, and Theodosius I, February the 27th, 380. And this is called the Cuntus Populus sometime. Everyone in the empire shall be a part of the religion that believes in God as a single deity of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, as taught by St. Peter to the Romans, and now taught by Damascus of Rome, Peter of Alexandria. These are two bishops, two major, what we call Petrine bishops, meaning Peter had something to do with their church and their church founding. Only those following this rule shall be called Catholic Christians, meeting place of those who follow other religions, including heretics, of a Christian variety have not be given the status of churches. And this is important because the word synagogue and the word church at this time was interchangeable. And now you're getting ready to see the Jews being fought. If you look at these decrees, you're going to see it in the decrees. The Jews are going to be elevated from high status in religion to a low status below the Christians. So now the Jews must call their meeting places synagogues, congregations, and etc. Because they lose that status that they once had in the empire. And such people may be subject to divine and earthly retribution. Those are some things that I just thought I would put out there. Anyways, I'm through. We're going to see can we uh, download this. Let me acknowledge those who are on here so uh, I can go offline. Jaffe, I think, is on here. Um, I noticed he liked the video that um, I just put out. Get over the media. I'm going to do my best to see can I download it after I get off here. I may have to log in from my computer and see if I can download this on my computer instead of my phone. John Jack. Mark is on here. Dr. Mark Miles is on here. Cleveland T.A. Meso is on here. And Graham is on here. So God bless all of you. Thank you for your support as well. Thank you for those of you who do give me cash outs from time to time. Thank you for those support. Those of you that send those uh, roses, flowers, and other gifts, thank you as well because your interactions help keep my name in the feed. The only thing that we probably could have did a lot better today is the number of likes because y'all know, like I told y'all, if y'all don't keep the likes at 300, 3,000, excuse me, then it does not push my videos out. So when I do lives, y'all help me keep my likes on these at 3,000 or more. Because when I do those other videos, it makes sure they get pushed out so that other people can see them as well. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Um, can't think of what else. Keep me in your prayers. Keep me in your prayers like I told you. I got to figure out what I'm going to do about my car and all of that. Um Keep my church in your prayers. All uh, that. Keep my conference that I do every year in your prayers. We'll be holding that in May Mableton again this year at St. Luke United Methodist Church. And um, it is by registration. Services are open to the public. The classes are by registration. And uh, if you go on the website, you'll see the register. If you're not a um, bishop, then there is a lower registration for you. I think it's like about forty or fifty dollars, something like that. But for every for all the bishops and members of the Congress, it's at fifty dollars. And trust me, I don't never get enough to pay for the whole event. If it wasn't for people that um give and all that, we would never make the budget. But we th we're thankful that God helps us. We're good friends of the ministry that helps us make the budget every year. And we do good because we give what we give away at the Congress is worth way more than what we bring in. And we, like I said, we, we barely break even. We do do an offering in the services, but with the offering, the registration, all that, to put on an event like this and to give, because we give pastors information. It's like each year there's stuff in there for pastors that's not, there's, um, I don't know what this guy's talking about, but undoubtedly he didn't hear what I said. Taxes were around before uh, August, Augusta, 
Uh, that's not what I was saying. Next time you need to pay attention, my friend, because I actually read from an imperial law of the Roman emperor as it relates, listen carefully, as it relates to religion. Mm -hmm. So the next time, before you come with a response, God, what's wrong with my lips? Before you come with a response, know what I'm talking about because you make yourself look crazy. I'm going to say it one more time because it's undoubtedly you are on row 99. Let me go back and start from the very top since you thought you had a point. For a comprehensive list of all of the imperial laws of the Roman emperors as relating to religion in the Roman Empire, you can use the following links. And I got four links listed. They give you the laws from 311 Constantine to the aftermath of the Roman Empire and destruction of the empire. The, where this goes all the way to 431. Mm -hmm. And these are codes that have been compiled by um, P. R. Uh, Coleman Norton and by Clyde Farr, since you thought you knew something that you did not know. And since the Christian religion was not legal, legal, no, you thought you were saying something because you were trying to check me, but you didn't pay attention. I'm not being pride. I'm trying to help you. But if you're going to act arrogant, I'm going to block you. And like I said, the law I read, let me go back to the exact law that I read since you thought you were smarter than the teacher and you're trying to check the teacher. Uh, let me go back there. I said December 25th, 323 is when Constantine, you did not add context because we didn't need to know that taxes were before Augustine, Augusta. We need to know that because that's not context. Again, you're about to get your behind deleted. You did not add context because if you had paid attention, your comment was unwarranted and unneeded because it was not applicable to what I was saying. You're the one about to get blocked because what I said dealt with Christians, meaning the preachers. Let me get rid of you. I don't deal with ignorance. Let me get rid of ignorance. I clearly said that this is when churches became tax-free. I did not say that taxes were not being given in the empire. I wish people pay attention because they make themselves look foolish and then they get in their arrogance and their pride and try to defend themselves instead of making themselves realize how foolish they look. God, I don't understand these people. Hmm. Excuse me, I had the wrong year. I read one other thing. He didn't piss me off so bad. Common sense. See, that's why I keep telling y'all, think before you speak. I, I got the stuff in front of my face, and you're going to argue a point I'm not even arguing. I just told y'all Constantine didn't invent the Trinity, and I gave you proof. I just told you Constantine didn't give us Sunday worship, and I just gave you proof. I just told you Constantine is where the tax-free churches come from, and I gave you proof. This cat going to come in here and try to argue me talking about taxes was way before Augusta. It doesn't matter if taxes was before Augusta. That was not the point I was trying to make. What part of English did that cat not understand? The point I was making is that churches was first considered tax exempt. August 27, 433. Well, actually, clergy. Clergy and their servants shall not have to pay any taxes or any new taxes in the future, nor shall they have to quarter strangers they shall be tax exempt for if if they start their own business. 
Then it says in December 28, 356, clergy along with their wives, children, and servants are forever exempt from paying taxes, even if they engage in trade or rendering compulsory public service. So the first one says they will be taxed if they start their own business. The next thing said they are completely taxed and forever from anything, including if they engage in trade and business. What part of that you don't understand? I don't understand this. You don't have to come and argue a point I'm not making. Jesus be three fences, a mule, a cow, and a horse. Matter of fact, let me do, let me, before we get off of here, I know I've been here almost two hours. Indulge me just a few moments longer. I'm going to pull up one of these, uh, these uh, links here. And I want, I will warn you, you may have to use the Wayback Machine when you, if you get the book, you may have to use the Wayback Machine to pull the link up. I'm just letting you know, give you a heads up on that. Um, we're going to see in just a minute if I, once I put this in here. It should come up automatically. Yep, it did come up automatically. Okay. I'm just going to skim through this stuff and just read a few laws in here. I hate when people try to check somebody and they ain't studied this stuff for themselves. 3-11, April 30th, 3-11, Eusebius records an imperial decree. Persecution against Christians is officially ended by Constantine, Galerius, Lexinius, and Maximilian II. Maximilian II, in his part of the empire, in 311 and 312, reinstitute persecution against Christians. In 313, hold on, got to go down a little bit further. In three, well, hold on. In 313, Constantine ordered any property taken from Christian in persecution be restored. Licinius instructed his perfects and tribune to pay pray a prayer which he learned in a dream from an angel asking the supreme holy God to take care of the empire and grant their request. Constantine and Licinianus issued the Edict of Milan in early 312, 313, excuse me, saying that everybody is given the freedom to practice his religion in the way he sees fit. Not only are Christians allowed to worship as they choose, but any property taken from Christians must be restored. This is published everywhere in the empire. However, Maximin II does not do this until later on in 313 when he writes to his governors instructing them in light of the Edict of Milan to stop the persecution he recently renewed. In 313 later on, he issued his own Edict of Toleration because some of his governors was continuing the persecution of Christian again, granting them freedom, etc., etc., Constantine orders that the pre, that the Catholic priests, clergymen in North Africa be given imperial subsidies to correct what was doing the wrong that was being done to them by those in North Africa. In 313, Constantine released Catholic clergy from compulsory public service. They didn't have to work, serve in any government office nor in the army, the military. Okay, we're going to skip now. Constantine said in Feb October 15, 315, the Jewish community may not stone a Jewish convert to Christianity. Anyone who participates in such an act shall be burned. If anyone from the people joined the Jewish sect, he shall receive the deserved punishment for them. So you couldn't punish somebody for converting from Judaism to Christianity, but you could punish somebody who converted from Christianity to Judaism. Interesting. 
the, when you read these laws, I'm telling y'all, it changes your opinion of what some of these crazy folks say about stuff. I'm, I'm skimming through here. I read to y'all the one about him freeing people to go to church on Sundays. If something, he made a thing, he made a law saying if any building gets struck by lightning, that we they must make an inquiry be made of the soothsayers to see if they ordered their demons and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> to send the lightning. Any slave free before a bishop is automatically granted Roman citizenship. Interesting. This is what Constantine said April 18, 321. He says in July 3, 321, Every person shall have a right to leave property to the Catholic Church in his will. This is why you got to study, because if you don't study, these people lie to you and make up stuff and have you believe in stuff that's not true. In 321, 322, Constantine ordered toleration of the Donatists. That was an early heresy in the church. And that no action be taken against them. In December 25th, 323, Constantine said Christians shall not be forced into participating in pagan practices. You know, they love to say Constantine instituted pagan practices. Now, how could he institute something? He just told Christians, he told people that you cannot force Christians to participate in pagan practices. December 25th, 323. Anyone who serves as a Christian, in, uh, forces a Christian into such an act shall publicly be beaten unless he holds an honorable rank, in which case he will be fined and money given to the state treasury. That's interesting. And, and when you read this stuff, it changes your mind about the lies that were perpetrated by some of these churches. Interesting. I told y'all about the law he did against idol worship. I got some more. I'm looking for a couple more laws I want to read before I get off here. Because some of this stuff, when you look at it, it blows your mind because people don't say it otherwise and they don't lie. Let in December 1, in November 29, 330, in December 1, 331, Jewish elders were exempt from compulsory public service. Jewish priests and synagogue leaders are exempt from compulsory public service of a corporal nature, meaning they didn't have to serve on councils and in the armies and all the other stuff. Interesting. So even then, Constantine gave Jews a little bit. Let's go past Constantine to some other people like Constantinius and a few other. Constantinius said that Jews may not hold slaves or any people and must let them go free. Jews who circum circumcise non-Jewish slaves shall be executed. If a Jew is found to own Christian slave, all his slaves are to be taken away and freed. Interesting. Women who are formerly employed by the government as weavers but were led away by Jews may now return to weaving where after Jews may not unite Christian women in their villainy. If they are found proselytizing Christian women, they shall suffer capital punishment. Constantine, Const, Constantine, excuse me, 
341, pagan superstitions and sacrifices are completely forbidden in accordance with the law set forth by Constantine. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Y'all need to get this stuff because if y'all get it, I promise you. It'll blow your mind because a lot of stuff that these, especially one these folks try to perpetrate on us, you'll find that they were lying all the time. Uh, Constantinus and Julius, February 6, 376. Those who work for the church as grave diggers are exempt from the tradesmen tax law. So grave diggers were made tax, tax exempt. Interesting. November 10, 356. The privileges granted to the church in the city of Rome shall be firmly guarded. This is the beginning of when the church in Rome started trying to claim it was the head of all churches. You see some infighting between Arian bishops and um, let's go let's go to Julian let's go to Valentinian to uh, I need I can't wear my glasses and see this stuff on the computer y'all so sorry if I look like I'm crazy. A guilty Christian cannot be sentenced to the arena, you know, to die horrible deaths. No Christian shall serve. Shall have to serve in pagan temples. The judge who makes such an appointment will be executed, his property confiscated. November 7, 367. Watch this. Valentinian I, Galenus, and Gratian. Prisoners are to be released from prison to celebrate Passover. The exception are those who have committed treason, necromancing, poisoning, magic, adultery, rape, and murder. Well, my point is reading this is not to bore you, but to really show you some of this stuff that was said. We got decrees on this stuff. I was looking for like when when the Roman emperor decreed that all the old pagan places of worship were non Christian and that the church can have it. Valentinian, Valens, and Gratian in 375. Oh, I missed the year. I missed the year. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Wait, hold on, make sure. Is it three? Oh, yeah. No, I missed the year. I missed the year. Wait a minute. I thought I missed the year, but I'm ahead of myself. Now, where was I? The emperors issue a decree to protect people from trying to kill and persecute bishops who preach the Nicene Creed and the, and the Orthodox Christian faith. Priests, deacon, exorcists, lectors, and other church ministers are exempt from compulsory service. Of you have to keep doing it because every time new emperors comes up, they change, they change the law. So new emperors have to actually change, rechange the law. Oh, here you go. It said, altars and other secret worship places of non-Catholic religion shall be confiscated even if the gatherings there are have taken place with the permission of a local judge. Basically, they were confiscated and given to the Christians. I told you about three, February 327, 380. Y'all just need to get these decrees. That's all I'm going to say. Get these decrees for yourself and look at them because when you study them and you see, you'll see a lot of stuff people said that about Constantine and that Constantine never did. Maybe another emperor did. You see where they took bits and pieces of the truth and 
and then fabricated it. It, it blows your mind. If you're a student of history, get these decrees. They're online. Imperial laws of the Roman emperors um, for the towards of for religion. I found them just by searching it out. No. No, because if you are the elect of God, um, you're going to always be the elect of God. The issue is, Scripture says, if it were possible for the, God has shortened, if it were possible, God has shortened the very days of the elect, so they can't even be deceived. So the issue is, technically it's one saved, always saved. It ain't no such thing as you can follow, because if you can, if you can change your salvation, then God, God is not all powerful and He's not sovereign. And the Bible teaches, you know, the Bible literally says that when He said, Depart from me, I never knew you, the word there for never knew means never had a relationship with you. So if you fell away from heaven, from salvation, according to Scripture, you would never say to begin with. Because when He said, Depart from me, I never knew you, but they said, We're preaching you, we're praying that. He said, I never knew you, I never had experience with you. I never had relationship with you. God has general knowledge about everybody, but he literally said, I have no relational experience with you. You were never mine. So if somebody fall away and never come back, they were never his to begin with. Never his to begin with. Anyways, I know this, that goes against a lot of you because the Pentecostal Holiness movie is very Armenian and um, as well as the Methodist Church. But holiness only works in an Armenian context. I said again, the holiness movement only works and can only control and manipulate people as long as you hold on to an Armenian type of faith. When you operate from a point of view where Christ does the saving all you do is the believing then you learn to walk by faith in the faith that he's given us and you possess that faith and you allow Christ to live in you and to work in you of his pleasure so salvation does not, it's not about you it's about him really in its truest, I'm right, I wrote something in my syllabus for this year this year, we're going to be talking about, in our theology class, we're going to talk about the Holy Trinity. And let me close up some of these files here. And when you talk about the Trinity, the Oneness Church says he's Father in creation, Son in redemption. That's not Bible. That's not Bible. In, in, the, in the Bible, I must have closed the wrong file. Had to, because I... I just saw something that wasn't supposed to uh, close, and it did. And I hope it's not the right one I'm looking for. Yep, it did close. Not what I wanted to close. It closed. So I'm going to open back up. So, let me go back and open the right file up here. Yeah, so, the, in the, if you use the Trinitarian language like you're supposed to, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are at work. In redemption. It's not one over the other. It's all three. At work in redemption. And. That's one reason why I will always. Always be. 1,000% Trinitarian because only the Trinitarian view explains God and salvation in light of what the Bible correctly says. And I know people that would die, that die hard um, oneness that will go to their grave oneness. I can't do that because I'm not losing my life over some 19th century man 
men, excuse me, who misinterpreted the Bible because they were trying to force their understanding of a triune God who is so much above our understanding and knowledge. Their concept of him on us. And they didn't know any Greek or Hebrew when they were trying to define the person of God. I can't do it. Refuse to do it. Won't do it. Um, Yeah, I can't do it. Won't do it. Refuse to do it. Shall not do it. And all that. So I was trying to bring up something here real quick. See, y'all be having me on here too long. And I really don't get a chance to really. Oh, God. I went to the back of the book already. Oh, here you go. Right here. Intro to Theology, the Holy Trinity. I want to read something to y'all, and then I'm, I'm through. With regards to the economic trinity, we distinguish among the three persons of the Godhead in terms of their role in creation and redemption. In the, the fa it is the Father who sends the Son into the world for our redemption. It is the Son who acquires our redemption for us. It is the Spirit who applies that redemption to us. We do not have three gods. We have one God and three persons. And the three persons are distinguished in the economic trinity in terms of what they do. In terms of the ontological trinity, Three persons are distinguished by their personal properties. The Father begats the Son. The Son is begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son for all eternity. The term ontological trinity focuses on who God is. The term economical trinity focuses on what God does. When Jesus says he and the Father are one, he meant one in nature or ontologically they are one. Jesus tells us to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He is equating the three persons of the one God, making them all equal. Not saying all of him, he'll making all three of them equal. Equal. So when we speak of ontological, we speak of the essence, the attributes, the nature of the Trinity. And when we speak of the economic Trinity, we're dealing with the activity of God and the roles of the three persons with regard, roles of the three person with regards to creation and redemption. So he's not the father in creation, son and redemption, and the Holy Spirit in work today, because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible mentioned all three at work in creation, all three at work in redemption, all three at work in the world today. All three. Not three gods, but one God, three persons. And the Bible never said that Jesus is the name of the Father. And then when you read John 1 and 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This verse indicates that the Word and the Father are different and are one at the same time. This doesn't agree with classic one, this teaching. In one sense, the Son and the Father are identical. In another sense, they are distinguishable. Yep, so we're going to talk about that this year. It's going to be good. And then we're going to talk about the fact that Constantine did not invent the Trinity. This was far, that's far true that who was the first person to actually use the word Trinity, which is not Constantine at all, period. 
And uh, um, even though constant, Tertullian first defines the Trinity, however, Theophilus of Antioch is the first person to actually use the word Trinity. And when he did, he defined God as, as God, his word Logos, and his wisdom Sophia. So Holy Spirit by Theophilus is called Sophia, Holy Sophia, Holy Wisdom. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be an interesting discussion this year. And all that. But anyways, I'm done for today. Let me see if I can go off here and then down, up, download this. Well, first, I'm going to try to download it to my phone. And then I'm going to try to download it to, if I can't, I'm going to try to do it with my computer so I can actually put it on my uh, Facebook page. Anyway, y'all have a good day. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget to check out my link tree. I'm going to put my Facebook page on there soon for all of you guys that have been asking for it. They're trying to find a link to it. Some of you have actually added me on Facebook. Now remember, I want to warn you ahead of time. My Facebook page is not an evangelism page. This is more of a teaching and evangelism aspect and discipleship. My Facebook page is a page geared towards the church, the choir. So things will be said a little differently. Things will be a little bit more brash. It's not arrogance. Remember, I'm dealing with sanctified Pentecostal holiness folks who are stuck in their ways on my Facebook page which means sometimes the language has to be a little harder, a little more forceful, and not pastoral. Because I deal with a lot of people, again, who are stuck in their ways and think their way is right. And Facebook don't afford me the opportunity to teach like I teach on TikTok. I used to, but some of the people, you know, they fight like crazy. So otherwise, I'd be going to block the whole world on Facebook. Plus, uh, Facebook is geared towards my Facebook page is geared towards me obviously um, teaching about the stuff I write in my books and so a lot of people I have on t Facebook buy my books and um, and I talk a lot more about the books on Facebook than I do on TikTok if you want to direct questions to me personally then you either ask a question on the live and if it's something I want to answer on the live I do it or you can do the little question function where you can do the questions like, you know, the Q&A thing they got on Facebook, not Facebook, TikTok, or you send it to my inbox and I'll make a video out of it, like I do with everybody else. Some people ask me a question on Q&A, and we try to answer questions. So um, I would like to go offline now, but if you got some quick questions as it relates to the diaconate or whatever, I can take a couple of minutes and answer them. But if not, if they are kind of way left field, then I will screenshot your questions and actually make a post about it. So you got a few moments to go ahead and put your post out there. Um, so that we can, um, oh, excuse me, so we can discuss it. And I'm waiting. Ask your question real quick, because if not, in the next five minutes, I'm fixing to log off. I'll give you a little time before I log off, my friends, or bring your questions real quick. Do, 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 do. I wish I had to tick the uh, sound from uh, Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. So we can count them down. Okay, I gave you some chance. I mean, I was willing to answer whatever that germane to the position. The other question we're, ask, we're answering in another uh, context and all that. So um, I will say this. 
the diaconate starts with the with the guys we see in Acts chapter 16. And those, those guys are called proto-deacons or deacons. As a matter of fact, the noun for them is not used there, but the verb form of the word diaconis, uh, diacona, uh, diaconio, something like that. One of those words is used for the office of deacon. So I don't know if your question was about that. So that's why we know they are deacons, because the word, the, the verb form of the word deacon appears there in the text. Or the verb form of the adjective form, one of the forms appear there in the text for the work that they're ascribed to do. Deacons can be preachers, because we know that because in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts chapter 8, Philip, who is a deacon, is also an evangelist. So one does not necessarily have to be a elder or priest to be an event or be a preacher. They can be a deacon as well. Usually most churches give a deacons a license. Um, what we call the deacon, the elder or priest or bishop, these ministries have been in the church since its ex, ex, uh, inception. Uh, what we look at in Ephesians 4 and 11 are not fivefold. They have not even been called fivefold the whole time they've been in the Bible. They've only really been called fivefold in, in, since the 1900s. Before then, you had to either be a deacon or priest or bishop to be, to hold, be, to be apostle, prophet, evangelist, or teaching pastor. Yeah. Uh, before the advent of these so-called fivefold people who uh, have introduced a form of a priesthood that is more controlled than the Roman Catholic priesthood. Um, what else I wanted to bring that up? In your Bible, there are women deacons and male deacons. Matter of fact, Phoebe is called a deacon, and the only reason why she's not called one of your King James is because by the time King James get permission for that Bible to be written, there's no female deacons. And so they changed the word to accommodate the current usage in the church at that time, which is no female deacons. Um, what else? Um, I think that's about it. I'm trying to figure out some something, but I think that's about it. I think. Anyways, let's let's let y'all go. So y'all have a wonderful day. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, we'll talk to y'all. I pass also called the prophet. Mm. I wonder if you somebody I know. <laughs> I know somebody from New Jersey. A prophet, be careful when people call you prophet. Um, let's talk about, let's do this. Give me time to take a break off this app and do some other things. And since I'm grounded in Atlanta right now, because my car is tore up, I'll come back later on and we'll talk about we'll talk about ministry. So probably like eight or nine tonight, I come back and we do a live on Christian ministry. We'll talk about it. The deacon, the pri the priest, the elder, the pastor, and all of that in this biblical proper context. Because what I believe in the minister of the prophet, but most of these prophets today are soothsayers, witches and warlocks. Um they're not prophets in the biblical sense at all. They're not prophets. Anyways, so grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your days. Hopefully, I may see some of y'all on back on later on this evening. Let's say between 9 and 10. The 8 and 9 be too early. 9 or 10 o'clock, we'll come back again. I ain't got nothing else to do. All I'm going to get up and do now is probably cook me some pork chops and uh, some stuff to go with some pork, smother some pork chops probably. And uh, cook some other stuff. So, anyways, thank y'all for getting those likes up. They're going to make sure people get my video out. So, now before I get off of this thing completely, I'm going to log off from you guys. And now I need to check my video because I know by now, what y'all push down the feed is going to cause some of them crazy folks to hit my video because I explained that how the Ten Commandments are not called Ten Commandments.
Anyways, y'all have a good one. Grace and peace.